Hey, it's Bluebird. I'm a Canadian distiller making spirits in the UK. Welcome back. And if you're new to this channel, hello. If you're interested in distilling or more about the drinks industry, then this is the channel for you. In this video, we're talking about the long and interesting history of gin. So let's go. Juniper berries, the signature ingredient of gin, date back to Egyptian times when they were used as a cure for jaundice. And in ancient Greece, juniper berries were used as a cure for colic. Distillation, on the other hand, was invented in 700 to 800 AD by Arab alchemists who used distillation for medicinal purposes. Benedictine monks in the 11th century continued this tradition of distillation to achieve medical breakthroughs and also discovered that they could use distillation to create perfumes. In the UK, distillation started around the Tudor times, where it was done behind locked doors in monasteries, where they used British herbs, fruits, and spices to create medicines. Of course, when Henry VIII of England came into power, we had the dissolution of monasteries, which gave common people the opportunity to start distilling spirits themselves. However, these new spirits were not gin. Gin is from Holland, invented in the 14th century. Back then, it was not known as gin. It was known as Genever. Genever was a vastly different style of spirit as it was originally distilled from malt wine, making it more similar to a whiskey than the gin we know today. Jennifer arrived in the UK thanks to Robert Dudley, who was the first Earl of Leicester. He proposed to Queen Elizabeth multiple times, and she refused him multiple times. As a consolation prize, he ended up living in Kenilworth Castle, which is about 12 miles from Stratford-upon-Avon. Robert Dudley was a huge supporter of the Protestant cause, so in 1585 he led an English campaign over to Holland, where the English had their first taste of Dutch Geneva. As rumour of the spirit spread to the UK, a distillation boom began. Spirit shops popped up all over the country, particularly London. However, these spirit shops were not sure what they were doing and had no idea what they were making. The only thing they very quickly realized was that no matter what they put into their stills, it always came out completely clear. So they named it the only thing they saw fit, strong water. There were around 200 strong water shops during the time that William Shakespeare was working there. The 17th century was the starting point of the 30 year war between the Dutch and the Spanish. The British who fought alongside the Dutch were amazed by their military tactics. They spent the whole of that 30 year war drunk on Geneva. This meant they stormed into battle with very little fear and very little care, and somehow they ended up winning. The British were so amazed by this that they brought gin back into the UK as the next best thing. Gin was a beverage you could win wars with. So off the back of this, gin got its nickname Dutch Courage. This brought us into the first ever gin boom. To put it into perspective, the UK is currently in a gin boom. In 2019 alone, there were over 83 million bottles of gin sold in the UK. Now this sounds like a lot, but it's just over a bottle per person, so it's actually not that much. Compare this statistic to back in the 18th century when 70 liters of gin was made for every man, woman, and child. That's a shocking two bottles of gin a week per person. This means they were drinking more gin a week than we currently are in a year. So why were people in the UK drinking so much? Part of the reason was because of the hype that came with Dutch courage, but the primary reason, which we have to give people the benefit of the doubt for, is the fact that sanitation, particularly in London, was extremely poor. Drinking water would have been from the River Thames, which is also where the sewage and washing up went into. So technically speaking, drinking gin was the healthier option. As you can imagine, drinking so much gin led to a very high death rate and an extremely low birth rate. The infant mortality rate was a horrifying 24%, which in 1751 led William Hogarth to create the famous drawing called Gin Lane. 
He did this to show the effect that gin was having on the people of London during the mid 1700s. The standout image here being the lady sat on the steps who's extremely drunk with her newborn baby falling to its untimely death. This led William Hogarth to portray Jin as Mother Jennifer, Mother's Jin, or Mother's Ruin, and that's exactly what it was. Because of this, the government decided they had to take action, so they introduced landlords into pubs to perform quality control checks, and also to make sure they got their portion of the gin tax. The other thing the government did was reduce the beer tax in order to encourage people to drink beer rather than spirits, the lesser of two evils. They also put a law in place to restrict the size of stills, so people were no longer allowed to produce gin in stills with a capacity of less than 1800 liters. This meant home distillers could no longer distill gin, and the gin that was being made was now more expensive because of the new tax. So what did that result in? An illegal gin trade. The Puss and Mew device was the face of the illegal gin trade during the late 1700s. This device also marked the invention of the first ever vending machine. A would-be drinker would walk up to the statue and ask, Puss, do you have any gin? and the statue would mail if the distiller was behind it, and a small drawer would open in its mouth. The drinker would insert coins and the drawer would close. Next, gin would flow out of a pipe in the cat's paw. These distillers had no idea what they were doing, so they never used to separate out the methanol, meaning people were going blind after a few drinks, hence the term blind drunk. Following the new law on the size of still in which gin must be produced, we had the birth of London Dry Gin. Just to clarify, London Dry is not a geographical indicator. Instead, it defines the process by which the gin has been made. The mass production of gin in the 19th century gave us the birth of brands like Gordon's and Beef Eater, gin brands that we see on the market today. Those were extremely interesting times as we had London dry gins, but gins were still being used for medicinal purposes. In the Navy, on long voyages on the East Indian trading route, sailors used to take daily lime rations to prevent them from getting scurvy. Drinking lime juice neat wasn't very palatable, so the sailors used to skip their daily rations. To prevent this, a man called Thomas Gimlet came up with the idea to mix the lime juice with sugar and London dry gin. After that, nobody wanted to miss their daily lime rations. This also marked the invention of one of the first gin cocktails that we see, the Gimlet. Another issue in the Navy was malaria. Quinine, sourced from the bark of a special tree, was used to treat malaria. South Americans used this bark for medicine and healing, so the British decided to create a tonic with it. The quinine was drunk in tonic water, but the bitter taste was unpleasant. British officers in India in the early 19th century took to adding a mixture of water, sugar, lime, and gin to the quinine in order to make the drink more palatable. Thus, gin and tonic was born. During the 1900s, gin was extremely unpopular due to the harsh and bad flavors that came with it being a mass-produced product. Gin was quickly replaced by vodka and the vodka cocktail culture. Particularly in the United States, the cocktail industry boomed after the invention of ice machines and refrigeration units. These new inventions propelled changes in the drinking culture all over the U.S until in 1920 when the prohibition began. This drove bartenders down to South America or over the pond to the UK where this cocktail culture spread. So how did gin become popular so fast? That's the big question. In 2009, three men went to court to try and get the minimum still size law removed after they had failed to obtain a license to create craft gin. Their success in getting this law removed created the current UK gin boom. It was only once this law was removed that people were able to open craft gin distilleries. Now there are more gin distilleries in the UK than there are Scottish whiskey distilleries. I hope you enjoyed learning about the history of gin. I'd like to thank the Shakespeare Distillery for helping with the images and the information for this video. 
Please support the channel by giving this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more distilling and distillery videos. This is Bluebird sending good vibes your way. I'll see you next time.